UFC 309 is coming up next weekend, and today, guys, I have the full card breakdown for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video. If you are new here, my name is Kyle. I am your guy with too many YouTube channels. Guys, timestamps will be there if you'd like to skip to any particular fight. We're going to go through pretty well everything that we can talk about with the fights. We're going to break them down. We're going to make predictions when we talk about fighters that I would like to win, and we are going to be going through the betting odds if they are available for each fight, which I'm pretty sure they all are, but as usual, we'll go through it, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Let's get started. Sorry, guys. I completely forgot to note this. I am currently recording this on the Wednesday before you are seeing it. So I know there's been a couple fights that fell out, but if they do end up replacing, let's say, I know they were looking for opponent for David Onama. That will not be here unless there's a couple changes to the card. Then I will update and make a brand new video diving into those fights specifically. But I'm recording the full card as it is on Wednesday night with most fights intact, but I know we lost, I can't remember how many, I think it was two fights right now, and they were talking about Charles Oliver versus Michael Chandler being in jeopardy. If that one gets canceled, then I'll just go in the YouTube studio and just cut it out, but regardless, let's get into the fights with what we have. Now, let's start this card off with Veronica Hardy versus Eduardo Mora. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm a little bit, <laughs> I'm a little bit stuck because I like Veronica Hardy, but I, I was like, <laughs> I'm looking at this fight, and I'm like, okay, this is actually a good fight for the division because I typically could care less, right? But I guess like I, I like Dan Hardy, I like Veronica Hardy, so I'll be I'll be watching this fight. It'll be okay. Anyways, we have Veronica Hardy, who is a fighter. <laughs> she's a WMA fighter who has a little bit more technique than your typical WMA fighter. The only thing that really stands about her, to be honest with you, is she has a really good body kick. But Eduarda Ronda Mora is a grappler with great ground and pound. Her stand-up definitely needs work, and sometimes in fights she can fade a bit. And another thing about Eduarda Mora is I personally, and I would love to know what you guys think in the comments down below about this, actually, because I question her heart, because sometimes she's when she's losing, she just, it, you can tell by her face, it doesn't look like she wants to be there anymore. You can just, like... I get that read from her every once in a while, and I would love to know what you guys think about that, by the way, but that's not entirely sure. Like, I just question her heart. That's it. Now, here's the issue. Is Eduardo Mora going up in weight? I think that's the case. Does it say? Does it say up here? Sorry, guys. I should have been prepared for this fight. Uh, it doesn't say up here or anywhere, right? Where this fight is taking place in what weight division? Does it say? Does it say? We would have to go back, but regardless, I don't think it matters all that much, to be honest with you. you guys, look at it this way. I think Veronica Hardy has enough technique throughout the three rounds to keep Eduardo Mora off of her. I think that she is improving a little bit, and she's on a little bit of a nice win streak. I don't think that she's going to be anything special in the division, but I got a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth. Like, to be honest with you, like, Eduardo Mora's looked okay when she's been able to implement her game plan, and apologies if we can hear my notification, but I don't, like, she, the split decision for Denise Gomez, she just did not look good in this fight, and I know that Denise Gomez is a better fighter than a lot of people in this division, that hopefully that ages well after this past weekend. <laughs> Again, I'm recording this before the protest and Magni card, but I just haven't been impressed with her. For Arca Hardy, at least I'm looking at her and I'm going, okay, you know what? She's been impressing me a little bit more. I am going to be picking Veronica Hardy to win this fight. I would also like to see Veronica Hardy win this fight. Again, I like her. I like Dan Hardy. I'd like to see her get the win. Let's take a look at what the odds have to say over on Odds Jam. You can see that Veronica Hardy is a minus 158 favorite. That makes sense to me, to be honest with you. Nothing to add about that as of right now. Eduarda Mora is sitting at the underdog. My pick is going to be Veronica Hardy. All right, guys, let's continue up the card over to Oban Elliott versus Basil Hafez. I'm very excited for this fight because, again, I like watching both fighters fight, to be honest with you. Oban Elliott has been impressing me so far in his career, and I always feel bad in saying that because <laughs> I'm not necessarily anybody to impress. Obviously, I'm just a guy sitting behind here on his microphone, but I don't know who else to rephrase that. Regardless, I've been impressed by Oban Elliott so far in his career. He is a very well-rounded fighter with high fight IQ. He has speed and technique everywhere. In my opinion, he's just a very underrated fighter in general. Also, that this might help him in this fight. His takedown defense is phenomenal, okay? He's looked so good since he's entered the UFC. And he's taken on some okay opponents too. I like Preston Parsons, Val Woodburn. Like, they're okay opponents to get wins over. And he's been shining so far. He's taken on Basil Hoffes, who is a grappler with... Powerful hands behind that grappling skill. He does a great job with control and picks his shots well in the ground and pound. But sometimes, and it's important, like it's important to know, especially if you're fighting somebody like Oban Elliott, he has cardio issues because sometimes, and sometimes he spends a little bit too much time just loading up on shots, looking for that one big knockout blow. So he can be low volume as well, but he doesn't always fight like that. So Basil Hoff is a little bit tough to get to know where you're going. He's nine and four. 
He's looked okay. He's had some okay performances. And there, well, everybody was talking about the Jack Del Madalena split decision loss. And that was a surprising performance. But then again, like, it was short notice. It was it, it was surprising for Jack Del Madalena. He wasn't preparing for an opponent like Basil Hoffes, right? And then, of course, he ended up getting the win over Mickey Gall. But that doesn't mean all too much. <laughs> Guys, I think for this matchup specifically, I think that Oban Elliott is going to get the win. I'm very confident in saying so. I think that... He will be just better than Basil Hoff is on the, on the feet, no problem, and I think he'll be faster. I think he, even if it goes to the ground, like, I feel like he can test, but regardless, he's going to be faster. He's going to be more technical while Basil Hoff is waiting to land that one big shot. I don't think he's going to get on Oban Elliott, and if Basil Hoff wants to take the fight to the ground, I think that Elliott's takedown defense will absolutely hold up. My pick is going to be Oban Elliott. I'm confident in this pick, and I am highly considering betting on Oban Elliott. Okay, let's take a look over at Odds Jam, and... I forgot to say, I hope Oban Elliott gets the win. But I do like Basil Hoffes too. Like, they're both fun to watch. So, Odds Jam has Oban Elliott sitting at a minus 158 favorite. Wasn't, was that close to the last one we just took a look at? Could be wrong. Maybe it's just because I'm looking at it here. But regardless, Oban Elliott sitting at minus 158. To be honest with you, I like that. I like that. I might just play it as is, to be honest with you. It's something that I'm very, very highly considering betting on myself. The pick is going to be Oban Elliott. All right, guys. Let's continue on over to the next fight. And guys, I want to know what you think about this one because... This is a fight that's very interesting in my opinion. I'm actually excited for this one. We have Mickey Gall taking on Ramiz Brahimaj. Now, both guys in kind of a must-win situation. Mickey Gall, 7-6 and six in his career. Ramirez Brahimaj at 10-5 and five in his career. Very, very important for both of them. I'll start with Mickey Gall. I like watching Mickey Gall. I like Mickey Gall. Now, my tune is changing on Mickey Gall a little bit because typically and throughout history, every time that we've seen him, he was just known as a grappler with no cardio. He seems to be improving a little bit. Recently, the cardio has been better, and we also saw a little bit of a striking display in his last fight, okay? He is still way too sloppy, in my opinion, but there are signs of improvement, and that showed against Basil Hafez. In my opinion, this fight could have gone either way. I, think, I don't remember if I mentioned that when I was just breaking down Basil Hafez, but Mickey Gall seems to be taking things very seriously, in my opinion, okay? Ramiz Brahamaj on the uh, on the other side of the coin is just a grappler with poor striking. Other than that, the only thing other to note is really he doesn't always show good fight IQ. He's very inconsistent. Same with Mickey Gall. I don't I hate being disrespectful breaking down these fights, but both guys are really low level in the UFC. I don't I don't I don't know how else to say that. I don't know how to say that nicely, okay? But at the end of the day, I'm breaking down these fights. Okay, here's here's my issue, okay? My Gut is saying to pick Mickey Gall, but my brain's like, who, who knows? <laughs> Both guys aren't necessarily that good, but, and I, and if you guys know, like, if you guys are brand new to the channel, I don't pick with my heart. Like, I like Mickey Gall, like I just said, and I hope that he wins this fight. I don't pick with my heart ever when breaking down these fights. I just, I gotta, gotta I kind of got a gut feeling on Mickey Gall in this one. Like, Ramiz, all he brings to the table is grappling, and Mickey Gall's a very good grappler in himself. He didn't do anything against Themba Garimbo. Mickey Gall at least, like, showed a little bit of hands in his last fight. I'm going to ever so slightly pick Mickey Gall because of the improvement that I've been seeing. I have not been seeing that on the other, on, uh, with his opponent. I'm going to pick him. I'm going to pick him. It's a very low-confidence pick, don't get me wrong. But I am going to pick him to get the win, and on, I, I hope Mickey Gall wins. I've always been cheering for him. I don't know what it is. I just have liked Mickey Gall throughout his career. Let's see what Odds Jim has to say, and yeah, it's a pick him. That makes sense to me. <laughs> it's a little bit of a toss-up fight. I don't know. I just got a more of a gut feeling on Mickey Gall. What do you guys think about this one, to be honest with you? And I'd love to know what you think about, like, whether or not Mickey Gall is improving. Now, guys, let's continue on up the card over to Marcin Tybora versus Janata Denise. Now, if you guys don't know, this is a newly placed fight on the card. Tybora is taking this on incredibly short notice. Well, Denise is kind of too, but Denise was supposed to fight on the previous card, of course, against Derek Lewis. So... Both guys taking this on short notice, but Denise is absolutely 100% in shape, okay? Marcin Tybora, well-rounded, I mean, well-rounded compared to the division, <laughs> with lots of experience, his striking's decent, he has good wrestling, he has good pressure, he's light and he's fast for the division, and that helps him get underneath people, and that's why he excels so much at, like, what he does when he does wrestle. Janata Denise, on the other hand, not a ton of breakdown about him. He's a well-rounded heavyweight who excels at technical kickboxing. Other than that, the only thing that really shines about him is he has a pretty good jab. He's 8-0 in his career so far. Denise has looked pretty good against, like, okay opponents. Like, I mean, he beat Carl Williams, but that wasn't, like, it, that fight could have gone either way. Austin Lane is, I'd say it's a good win. It's nothing to, like, ride home about, but he's shown that he belongs in the UFC, in my opinion. 
Marcin Tibor, on the other hand, has been weirdly winning, and he found his way with two losses to both Tom Aspinall and Sergei Spivak. <sighs> Here's the thing. I keep picking against Tybora. I think I've been picking against him. I don't recall who I picked against Sergei Spivak because that's a pretty close fight. Regardless, he seems to just get it done sometimes. Just getting underneath people, either submitting him, ground and pounding him. We haven't had Denise tested. But then again, like, Carl Williams could have brought that pressure, right? I just, I need to see more from Denise to really be confident with him moving through the UFC. Like, if Tybora takes him down and he works through that, then I will be like, okay, Denise seems like he's a real deal, but so far he seems like the real deal. Another thing that I'm really worried about with this fight is, first of all, Tybora taking this on short notice. Who knows if he's in shape? And Denise, I don't know if he cuts weight. That's the problem. If anybody could shed light on that in the comments, I would appreciate it. Because he was just supposed to fight in the last card. If he's cutting weight again, that's obviously not good. What if it makes you chinny? What if your energy's drained? For those reasons, and this is what I'm going to talk about in the betting guide video coming up, I would personally stay away from this fight. But I am going to pick Janata Denise. He's the younger guy. He's more powerful. There's a clear difference in the striking, but I could see this fight going either way. If Tybor gets to the ground, he'll have the advantage. If Denise keeps it on the feet, he's going to have the advantage. It's a, cl it's a classic stand-up fighter versus grappler matchup. I'm going to give it to the guy who has been on a very, very nice roll of momentum in Janata Denise, but Tybora is a guy to bust parlays, and Tybora is a guy to have some upsets. Now, because this fight was newly added to the card at the time recording this video, there are no odds out for it right now. Who I would like to see? I like both guys, to be honest with you, but I'm kind of liking Denise just a little bit more. I would like to see where he goes in the heavyweight division, to be honest with you. Sorry, my puppy is coming over here, but I am I am picking Janata Denise to get the win. All right, guys, let's continue on and move up the card over to Jim Miller versus Damon Jackson. Interesting fight. Good match, in my opinion, because both guys are coming off of an absolute demolition loss. Jim Miller losing to Bobby Green and Damon Jackson just losing to Chepe Mariscal. So we'll start with Jim Miller. He is a well-rounded fighter who can match you up pretty well all aspects of MMA. If I had to pick his biggest strength, I would choose his grappling. But again, Jim Miller is a guy that can honestly do it all. The only issue with Jim Miller is he's old now. He's taking more damage. He isn't as fast as he used to be. His heart and cardio still are there, though. So the day is coming. He's 41 years old. The day is coming where we look at Jim Miller and go, oh, you should not be here anymore. He has so much experience, but also so much damage on his body, okay? Damon Jackson, on the other hand, who's a fighter who literally wants to come forward and grapple with you. He wants to walk forward, he wants to bring you to the down, and he does a good job pressuring to do so. Weirdly enough, he seems to be recently like starting to gas in his fights, but I don't know if that's just a couple performance type thing, it's opponents that he's taking on, it could be him getting old, he's 36 years old now, that definitely happens. So, both guys are heading towards the end of their career, both guys are in similar spots in their career where they're struggling to put together wins. The problem is though, when you have guys that are 41 years old and you have another guy that's like 30, 36 years old, these fights that they've been taking, like Chepe dominated him in every aspect possible. And I understand, like, they both took on great opponents, especially Damon Jackson. Like, you got to worry about life-changing damage there. You got to worry that their body won't be able to keep up after damage like that. Same with Jim Miller. He just took an obliterating beating from Bobby Green. It's horrible. Like, there were... Multiple 10-8 rounds here. That's the issue. So you got to wonder how they're going to show up. If I had to pick this fight, I'm still worried. I'm always hesitant to pick a guy over 40, but I'm going to pick Jim Miller to get the win here. He has more options there. I believe he he might be a better grappler than Jamin, Damon Jackson, to be honest with you. I just worry about his age. I worry about his damage. I worry about him coming back from that last performance. But still, Jim Miller, on paper, is the better fighter. He's a more experienced fighter. He's beaten better guys. I'm going to pick Jim Miller to get the win. It's a little bit of a low confidence pick in my opinion because, again, I, I worry about how they're going to show up. And for who I would like to see them win this fight, 100% I would like to see Jim Miller win. He's one of my favorite fighters of all time. And it's going to be a sad day when Jim Miller retires, man. I hope he gets the win. But let's go take a look at odds, Jim. Wow, okay. Damon Jackson said at a minus 123 favorite. To be honest with you, I get that. Jim Miller hasn't been looking all that great, but... To be honest with you, like, Damon Jackson hasn't been looking all that good either. I guess I understand it, but I think it should... It's kind of a pick -em. Kind of. <laughs> I don't hate these odds at all. All right, guys, let's move on. Let's move on to the sleeper fight of the card. This is one of the fights, like, honestly, I would say I'm most excited for the co-main event personally. Then maybe the main event 
And then this fight. Like, this fight is one of the best fights on the card. Jonathan Martinez, Marcus McGee. Very important fight for the outside, or like, the lower part of the rankings in the Bantamweight division. Very important fight for both of their careers. I am very high on both these guys. I cannot wait to watch this fight. Jonathan Martinez. Actually, to be honest with you, both of them, there's not a ton of breakdown over here. Jonathan Martinez, who's a pretty complete fighter with especially good Muay Thai and leg kick specifically. Marcus McGee, on the other hand, he's a very well-rounded, powerful, and explosive fighter both on the feet and on the ground. He has great striking, takedowns, submissions, scrambles, cardio, and on top of that, he can keep up the danger aspect that he has throughout the entire 15 minutes that he fights. Both of these guys are fantastic. There's one thing about this matchup that is really making me lean one way, and that's Jonathan Martinez and his leg kicks. Marcus McGee, while he is a great fighter and he has a promising future, he has issues with dealing with leg kicks. And who has some of the best leg kicks in not only the Bantamweight division, but the entirety of the UFC? Jonathan Martinez. Issue, though. Another issue. Jonathan Martinez has looked near perfect in the UFC so far until he ran into Jose Aldo, okay? I don't know what it was, it, he didn't fight like Jonathan Martinez. He was just way too low volume in this fight. Aldo hit him more, edged out each round. I was very disappointed with Jonathan, Mar- Jonathan Martinez's performance here because he's fought guys, in my opinion, like not better than Jose Aldo in his prime, but like the version of Jose Aldo that is right now, I think that Jonathan Martinez has fought better guys. You know, he's looked so good so far. But hey, people have a one-off night that could have been a one-off performance. I'm just saying it didn't look like Jonathan Martinez in that fight to me. Marcus McGee, though, been watching this dude since he got into the LFA, and he brought went, went to the UFC soon after, and he has just been destroying people. He's just been do- destroying people, man. Like, he's very explosive, very dangerous. Both guys have such a promising future. <sighs> I'm going to pick Jonathan Martinez because of the leg kicks. I think that, like I said, he has some of the best leg kicks, not only the Bantamweight division, but the UFC, and Marcus McGee has issues taking those. In such a talented and close fight like this, I think something like that matters. And for that reason, I'm going to be picking Jonathan Martinez to get the win. I'm very excited for this fight. I cannot wait. I like both guys a lot, but I think I'm a bigger fan of Jonathan Martinez. I've been cheering for him since he got into the UFC. I'm going to continue cheering for him. I just like the guy, but I like Marcus McGee too, man. This is a great fight, and it's a shame that somebody has to lose this fight because it's so tough. You can see the odds too. It's a near pick em. Both guys are absolutely fantastic. I can't wait for this fight. I can't wait. And guys, let's continue on up the card over to Chris Weidman versus Eric Anders. Chris Weidman, 40 years old, coming off of that eye poke TKO. Looking fantastic, okay? Oh, I'm sad, man, because you know what? I'll talk about it when I talk about who I'd like to see win, okay? Chris Weidman. We all know Chris Weidman at this point. He's a well-rounded fighter, primary wrestler, but he is, unfortunately, past his prime. He is now slow. He's sloppy. He's hesitant, relying on his toughness to get him through his bouts. Eric Anders, on the other hand, also aging but not showing the same signs of Chris Weidman. Something I forgot to mention, too, is, of course, we all know Chris Weidman snapped his leg. He hasn't been the same fighter since he came back. He is, uh, Eric Anders, I'm talking about, he is a decently well-rounded fighter for the division. He's big. He's strong. He has good power. He has a good wrestling game. There's nowhere that Eric Anders shines. He's one of those fighters, but he is a pretty good fighter overall. Only issue with Eric Anders Like I said, he's 37 years old, pushing 38. In my opinion, his age seems to be catching up with him now because he seems to have been slowing down recently as fights progress, but he's also hittable, but that's just Eric Anders for you. (laughs) So, guys, there's not a ton to break down here. I'm not going to go through the records. Eric Anders has fought really good opponents. Same with Chris Weidman. They've both been very inconsistent. Chris Weidman, like, I can't believe he won. I can't believe that was a close fight. Like, Bruno Silva's washed too, man, but... I can't believe it, okay? <laughs> I don't think that Chris Weidman can beat anybody in the middleweight division. Like I said, he's slow, sloppy, and hesitant. He's going to be the same against Eric Anders, and he's over 40 now. I'm very confident that Eric Anders will be able to get the job done. He's bigger, or I don't know if he'll be bigger, but he'll definitely be stronger. I think that he'll push the pace better. I just think no matter where the fight goes, Eric Anders is going to do better. There's not a ton of breakdown there. I just, that's how I feel. I think that's how the fight's going to go. In saying that, though, okay, here's my issue. Chris Weidman's one of my favorite fighters ever. I, I I hate the way that he beat Bruno Silva. He's celebrating the eye poke and really kind of standing on it. 
I just think it's a scummy thing to do, man. Like, I don't know. It left a really sour taste in my mouth, but that is one time out of the years upon years that we've been watching Chris Weidman. So he still is up there with my favorite fighters, and I still will be cheering for him. It's just, I was like, it left a sour taste in my mouth as a fan, man. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. If any Chris Weidman fans are out there, comment down below if you feel the same way as me. But regardless, I still hope Chris Weidman gets the win over there. And you could see that Eric Anders is not even a 2-1 to favorite. That's crazy to me. And <laughs> I hate putting myself in positions where I'm going to bet against a fighter that I love, like Chris Weidman, which I'm highly considering placing a bet on. To be honest with you, I'm, just pr I'm probably going to do it. I hate putting myself in that position, but I think those, uh, that those odds are a steal. There's no chance that Chris Weidman wins this fight. This is my most confident pick on the card. Like, I don't know why they're that close. I think it's crazy. Chris Weidman's washed now. <laughs> that's it. He's he's gonna lose. But guys, before we move on over to the main card, I want to stop you for just a second. If you are either interested in supporting the channel or seeing where I'm putting my money where my mouth is because I talk a lot about betting on this channel, you can check out the channel membership in the pinned comment description down below or right next to the subscribe button. Every single Thursday or Friday, I post a community, a community note page as well as a members only video explaining exactly what I'm doing with my money each week. If you're interested in either I never say, I, I always say never just a blindly tale. If you're interested in either supporting the channel or combining your own fight research with my fight knowledge, that's something awesome that you can do. And again, guys, you can check that out in the pinned comment description down below or right next to, or right next to the subscribe button. Excuse me. I don't know why I stumble over my words sometimes when I advertise this. Regardless, <laughs> we also have Odds Jam as a partnership on the channel. If you'd like to check out Odds Jam, which is a great tool for serious sports bettors, if you have multiple sports books, you can find the best odds, and they are very, very quick at what they do. If you want to sign up, you can check out my link again in the pinned comment description down below and use code CLENBAT. You can get a discount if you want to sign up to Odds Jam. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Let's move on to the main card. All right, guys, let's move on to, like I said, the main card. We have Mauricio One Shot Ruffy taking on James Lion Top. Okay. It's one of those fights, again, where there's not exactly a ton to break down over here. Mauricio Ruffy, a very powerful and creative striker with great distance management. He isn't afraid to get creative. He has takedowns in his back pocket, and when he smells blood, this dude is extremely dangerous. James Liontop, on the other hand, is a striker who does a great job when things kind of get a bit dirty in the clinch. He has nice knees. He has nice elbows. He has really good cardio. He has good pressure. He has decent power and pretty good fight IQ. And while he does excel at striking, he does have a well-rounded game. He can be brought through wars. And he can stand with anybody in the striking department, but I think I'm gassing him up a little bit too much right now. Those are pretty well just his strengths. Like I said, I didn't say this, but like, I'm saying that he's a really good fighter. He just hasn't been able to put it together though. Like, you know, when he wins, he, he looks okay, but I haven't been liking the last two performances that we've had over here. And I understand there was a split loss to... To Vyshlev Borshev, but still, like, I'm not I'm not too high on James Lyon top myself, but he does possess some really good skills. Somebody that I am very high on, on the other hand, though, is definitely Mauricio Ruffy. Guys, he his last two performances, especially, have looked so good. They've looked so good. They've been pretty well, like, well, yeah, especially the Jamie Malarkey one. Flawless. Here's my logic with this fight. And here's gonna be my logic with a lot of the guys from this camp. He's a fighting nerd. I'm sold on the names of the fighting nerds. I'm going to pick them, and I'm probably going to keep betting on them until one of them loses. <laughs> but even if, like, I think these guys are such a real deal, this might just be the best gym right now. I am so confident, and not only Mauricio Ruffy, but the vast majority of the fighting nerds that we've seen. I, th I don't know what they're doing there, but they're doing a great job. I'm picking Mauricio Ruffy. He's probably going to have another flawless performance against James Liontop. He's so good. That camp is so good. I have complete faith in them. Mauricio Ruffy, very confident pick of mine. And I would like to see him win. I also want to cheer for the fighting nerds. They're fun. They're exciting. What's not to love about them? Let's see what Odds Jam is saying about... Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Mauricio Ruffy sit at a minus 885 favorite. And you know what's crazy? That makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I'm very confident in him to get the job done. And I think he's going to get the job done. I want to see him win. I can't. I want to see the glasses. I want to see the fighting nerds continue all the way to their journey to the top, man. All right, guys, let's move on. And I've been waiting to talk about this fight because I am ready to hear about it, okay? Bo Nickel, Paul Craig. All right, all right, all right, all right. Hear me out. Hear me out. And you can probably know what I'm going to say, <laughs> okay? You have Bo Nickel, who's a very experienced and very accomplished wrestler with BJJ in his back pocket to back it up. Other than that, we haven't seen much else 
in MMA. Paul Craig, a grappler who lacks striking. He wants to get you to the ground. If he gets you to the ground, he's very dangerous. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Paul Craig. I know that he has looked awful as of recently. He's looked beyond awful, okay? I will say his opponents have been pretty good besides maybe Johnny Walker, okay? Johnny Walker. But then again, that's a that's a good matchup for Johnny Walker, to be honest with you. He got the win over Andre Meniz, which is a good win. Vulcan Ozdemir is a good opponent to lose to. Brendan Allen is a good opponent to lose to in a three-round fight. And Kyle Brajo is a fantastic fighter to lose to. Okay. And this is one of the worst performances I've seen in a long time. He he did nothing in this fight. He, like, backed up, kicked, and pulled guard. He couldn't do anything. And my takeaway from this was Paul Craig is done. He's washed now. Kyle Brajo, though, I'm going to cut him some slack on that. Here's the problem. Bo Nickel and Cody Brundage. No disrespect to Cody Brundage. I'm not one of those guys that just says, like, oh, my God, he's, like, so bad. But although, like, compared to UFC level, Cody Brundage doesn't necessarily belong in the UFC. My takeaway from this was he didn't live up to the hype at all. He had problems even in the wrestling department with Brundage. He's not the real deal. I'm not so sure that he's good. In saying that, though, I still haven't seen enough of Bo Nickel. I'm not convinced that he's going to be this big contender that the UFC is hyping him up to be. <laughs> I'm going to hear about it, man. Guys, my gut's telling me that Paul Craig's going to win this fight. I think that Paul Craig's going to get it done. Okay? If this fight goes to the ground, Paul Craig is insanely dangerous. Is he going to be able to submit Bo Nickel? Like, the dude submitted Magomed and Goliath. The dude can submit anybody, to be honest with you. He submitted Andre Meniz. That's an amazing submission win to have. I don't see any danger sense in Bo Nickel that I've seen in the recent guys who have absolutely annihilated Paul Craig. That's my issue. I'm not convinced of Bo Nickel yet. I'm going to pick the guy who has experience against the toughest of the tough in the division. We know what to expect from him. And I need to see Bo Nickel get past the Paul Craig before I pick him. I know I'm going to hear about that. And you know what's funny? If any of you guys watch UFC Predictions Tracker, which is a fantastic channel, you guys should go check it out. It recaps all of the channels and all the MMA prediction channels and just gives a graph of like, hey, here's what everybody's choosing. And every once in a while... You'll get, like, every single UFC predictor ever on one side. And then you're going to see, like, one person on the other side for a different fighter. Hi, baby. Sorry, my puppy just came to see. She's bored. She wants to go out. Hi, sunny girl. I have a feeling that I'm going to be that guy, that one singular person on the other side of that graphic. But honestly, guys, if you haven't checked out UFC Predictions Tracker, you really, really should. So, in saying this, I like Bo Nickel. But Paul Craig, I, I've been a fan of for a long time. I just like Paul Craig as a guy. I'm going to hope he wins. And I, honestly, I'm not saying this as, hi, baby, hi. I'm not saying this as a fan of Paul Craig. Again, I don't pick with my heart on this. I really do believe that he, he has a better chance of winning than Bo Nickel does. Let's see what Odds Jim has to say about this, okay? Paul Craig, and I, I knew this was going to be something like this. Hi, baby. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my puppy wants to run. Hi. What are you doing? She's sitting pretty. <laughs> Hi, I'm going to take a jump cut. Yeah, poor thing. She hasn't done anything all day. I've been at work all day, and I came home and sat down on my computer, and usually I end up running her a little bit. But regardless, I know I'm going to hear about it for the Paul Craig pick. I'm not saying it's a confident pick of mine, but I just believe that he has a better chance of winning than Bo Nickel does. I might throw a couple dollars on him just for the heck of it. Again, I'm ready to hear about it. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready, guys. Now, guys, let's continue on to the weirdest featured fight of all time. We have Karini Silva taking on Viviane Arujo. Karini Silva, she's a well-rounded fighter who exceeds at grappling. She's very strong takedowns. She has very smothering control, and she's always attacking with great submissions and accurate slicing elbows. She is very good. She lives up to the name killer. She's one of those very, very violent fighters in the WMMA divisions. Viviane Arujo, on the other hand, not a ton to break down with her. She's a good striker, but lacks... <laughs> She's a good offensive striker, but she does lack defense. She, show can t she can show technique. She can fade. So it's sometimes tough to call her fights. She's 12-6. and six. The record speaks for itself. She's 37 years old. Every single time she fights a step up in competition, she loses. Alexa Grasso, Amanda Hibas, Natalia Silva. She gets the wins over Jennifer Maya and Andrea Lee. That's how her career goes. Kearney Silva, on the other hand. I have been very, very high on her. Uh, throughout like the her UFC journey so far until she ran into Ariana Lipsky da Silva now the name always messes me up at this point but regardless 
this was the big test for me. She got past the Lipsky test, and it was a close fight, but she edged out with the wrestling. I think she had a good performance here, and now I am officially convinced of Karini Silva in the division. Guys, Karini Silva's going to win this fight. I'm very confident in saying so. Viviana Rujo is 37 years old, kind of sucks, and Karini Silva is a very good fighter. That's how I'm going to go about it. She's probably going to take her down and destroy her. I'm very confident Karina Silva to get the job done. I'm going to hope Karina Silva gets the job done as well because she's more exciting for the division. But I think I think this one's going to be pretty easy. Karina Silva sitting at a minus 276 favorite. Makes sense. Don't have a ton to break down there. Karina Silva's going to get the job done. Very, very confident in saying so. All right, guys. Let's move on to the co-main event. We have Charles Dobronx Oliveira versus Michael Chandler. The rematch. I think this is my most anticipated fight on the card. I love watching both of these guys fight. There is no way this fight sucks, especially after their first fight. Very quick recap of the first fight. It was pretty back and forth. Chandler was doing a great job. He had Oliveira insanely hurt, but in typical Charles Oliveira fashion, Oliveira ended up getting a finish. Now, Charles Oliveira, he is a very, very complete fighter with dangerous Muay Thai striking, one of the best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu games in all of MMA. He's very technical in all aspects of MMA. He has all the experience, cardio, heart and pressure. The dude can do everything. About his heart, though, in his past, he has had issues, and that has been a big criticism of Charles Oliveira, but that seems to be him fixed in recent years. You can knock this guy down all you want, and he'll come back with more danger than you've ever seen before. So, Charles Oliveira is, I still, I don't think he has a heart issue at this point. When people do criticize that, I understand what they're saying. In his old fights, Charles Oliveira used to fold. That's not the case anymore. Michael Chandler, on the other hand, very explosive and heavy-handed wrestler with decent cardio, great heart, and he does a great job at pushing the pace. Oftentimes, and oftentimes, <laughs> he lacks fight IQ. He can get up, caught up in the moment wanting to please the fans, leave his chin in the air, his hands down, and get into a slugfest. When he's focused, when he uses his technique because he has it, he is very, very good at what he does. Michael Chandler has been fighting, and same with Charles Oliveira, they've been fighting the toughest of the tough in the division. You had Dan Hooker, Charles Oliveira, Justin Gaethje, he beat Tony Ferguson and lost to Dustin Poirier. In all of these fights, Michael Chandler was extremely competitive. He drags you through hell to beat him. Charles Oliveira, the same thing, though. Besides the loss to Islam Makachev, but that even aged well because who's giving Makachev issues besides Volkanovski? You have the beautiful win over Benil Dariush and the really good performance against Armin Sarukin. A lot of people think that was a robbery. I disagree. I thought Armin won that fight. It's just a case of Charles Oliveira, Van Oliveira fans loving Charles Oliveira. Guys, I think this fight's going to go similarly to the first one. Charles Oliveira is 35 years old, but he is still in his prime. He is still, he hasn't lost a step. His age hasn't started to show yet, although that day is coming, especially with the damage that Charles Oliveira has taken throughout his career. The big worry is on the side of Michael Chandler because his last fight was two years ago. He has been waiting for Conor McGregor. He's been training for Conor McGregor, a completely different fighter than Charles Oliveira. Granted, he still had a fight camp, but you have to worry when somebody like Michael Chandler is getting towards the age that he is. He could just show up and look like a completely different guy than what we've seen him in just his last fight against Dustin Poirier. Michael Chandler, assuming that he is the same guy, I think this fight is... is I'm like 60-40 on Charles Oliveira. Because again, Michael Chandler had amazing moments. And you have to question too, is Michael Chandler going to come in and just fight stupid? Or is he going to get to the title? He needs to win. He's in a must-win position in his career. The whole world's making fun of Michael Chandler right now and has been making fun of Michael Chandler. I don't think that that is necessarily right of the fans to do. I don't think he deserves the the hate that he's getting. Anybody on this planet would have wanted a Conor McGregor fight. But regardless, like, I don't know if he's going to take all of this and really focus on getting the win. If he's not going to leave his chin up in the air, if he's not going to get a new slugfest, he fights with a heavy wrestling pressure game and tries to, like, maybe implement what Islam Makachev did a little bit. I have questions about Michael Chandler's approach. That's all. Is he going to take it seriously? Is he going to please the fans? And is he going to, like, he looks to be in great shape right now. But he, you have to worry about how much taxing's on his body. He's been in training camp for like two years. <laughs> could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. It's just, he could show up an improved version of himself, but he could also show up worn out because he's 40. You know? Too many questions. I'm going to go with Charles Oliveira. I'm kind of sitting at like 60, 40, 70, 30 on that. I think it could go similar to the first one. Michael Chandler giving me issues and Charles Oliveira. No matter what you do to him, he'll either submit you or he'll outstrike you. I think he is just the better striker in general. I think that Charles Oliveira is going to get the win. This is one of those fights where it's a shame that somebody has to lose because I really do like both guys. I really hope Michael Chandler gets a job done, though. I don't think that he deserves the hate that 
every at all the UFC fans are giving him right now. In reality, every single fighter ever would have probably done the same thing that Michael Chandler was doing. He finally gave up on the Connor fight. I think that he is getting way too disrespected by the MMA community right now, and I would like to see him get the win. I'd like to see him have a shiny performance, and then he's gonna, <laughs> and then he's gonna end up having <laughs> to deal with all of the Charles Oliveira fans automatically hating him after that. Now let's take a look at Odds Jam and see what they have to say. Charles Oliveira sitting at a minus two fifty five favorite. Honestly, that makes sense with all the questions about Michael Chandler right now, and with Charles Oliveira still being Charles Oliveira, the very dangerous guy that he is. Those odds make sense to me. There might be some underdog opportunity on Michael Chandler, but that would mean you're just sweating through that entire fight because Chandler's gonna <laughs> Chandler's just gonna have he's gonna look like he's KO'd. He's not gonna look like he's KO'd. He's gonna be pushed the pace. His chin's gonna be out there. If your money's on him, you're gonna be like, come on, Michael, put your hands up and wrestle. But you might not do that. It's gonna be a great fight. I can't wait for it. I'm picking Charles Oliveira, but I hope Chandler gets the job done. Alright, guys, let's move on to the main event. John Bones Jones versus Stipe Mayochik. I'm still not confident that this fight's going to happen until I see John Jones in that octagon. I'm like Hamzat Shemaev with that. He could pull out and we might see Aspinall, okay? What is there to break down though, guys? Honestly, for the fight styles, like we all know him now. John Jones is a very complete fighter. He can, <laughs> John Jones can do it better, any fight style better than anybody else. If wrestling's your strength, he'll beat you there. If it's striking, same thing. He's a very long, beyond strong and amazing fighter in all aspects of MMA. Many people consider him to be the greatest fighter of all time. Stipe Miocic, on the other hand, people consider him to be the he greatest heavyweight of all time. He's well-rounded, fast, powerful heavyweight who excels at boxing and wrestling. He has amazing cardio, heart, durability, and he's great at pushing the pace for five rounds. The only issue is Stipe Miocic is old now. He's 42 years old, going on 43 years old. He hasn't fought since his loss to Francis Ngannou almost four years ago. This is the big issue. If we're talking about a Prime Stipe here, I would actually pick him to beat John Jones. I wouldn't hesitate, and I'd say that pr Prime Stipe would beat Prime Jones. There are heavyweights in their prime that I think would beat John Jones. Daniel Cormier in his prime, I think that Cain Velasquez in his prime would beat him. And I do, I wholeheartedly believe that Stipe Miocic would beat John Jones in his prime. But this is not a Prime Stipe that we're talking about. This isn't the Stipe who fought Daniel Cormier twice. This isn't the Stipe who beat Francis Ngannou the first time. This is not the Stipe Miocic who beat guys like JDS. He's not the same guy that... Got all of these amazing wins over guys like Alistair Overeem. Stipe showed up last fight looking slow, looking like he didn't want to be there. And that was just in 2021. That was just in 2021. John Jones, on the other hand, he beats everybody. But I will say, I will say, okay, because John Jones hasn't looked great as of recently. Tiago Santos was a split decision win. I get the argument for Tiago Santos, but you should not have had issues with Tiago Santos. Dominic Reyes beat him 100%. And Cyril gone, like, it was a quick fight, but it was a tailor-made matchup for him. And John Jones didn't look like to be in the best shape ever, okay? John Jones, he's got the reach. He's, I, I don't know, man. I don't know what, is he, gonna, does he weigh in at 248 for heavyweight? Because that's going to be interesting, because I was going to say, does Stipe Miocic have a strength and weight advantage on him? I just, I have such a hard time seeing Stipe even chinning John Jones. I can't trust Stipe to show up and want to fight. He's probably showing up for a paycheck. Stipe is retiring after this. Same with John Jones. Like, <laughs> what are we supposed to say here? Stipe is a shell of his former self. He's going to lose this fight. And if anybody's picking Stipe Miocic and he happens to get the job done, it's one of the craziest upsets in UFC history. I don't believe you could be an MMA fan and, or an MMA predictor and seriously pick Stipe Miocic. I know I'm going to hear about it in the comments about Paul Craig. I know I'm going to hear that, okay? <laughs> but come on. You have the greatest fighter of all time fighting somebody who's old. How else are we supposed to pick this? John Jones is going to beat him. I hope that Stipe Miocic wins. I like Stipe. And that would be the funniest thing that has ever happened ever. The Dana White memes that would come out. And I'm a guy who likes Dana White. I'm a fan of Dana White. But that would be arguably the funniest thing to ever happen in MMA. If Stipe just walks out and obliterates John Jones. I'm coping. I hope that happens. That would be the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But there's no chance that happens. John Jones is going to get the win. Stipe's 40. He's 42. Excuse me. Let's see what Odds Jam has to say about this. Wow. It's crazy to me. It's crazy to me that Bo Nickel's a bigger favorite. That's crazy. We have one over 1.5 at minus 322. That's a little shocking to me. I can see John Jones finishing him pretty early. But regardless, John Jones, huge favorite. Somehow Bo Nickel's a bigger favorite. <laughs> I can't wait to see this fight. I would be cheering for Stipe Miocic so hard. 
I don't want John Jones to ride off into the sunset. I want Stipe to beat him. But guys, speaking of Stipe Miocic, I want you to check out this video ranking every single MMA content creator. I would love to have you guys over there. Thanks so much for watching. Take care, everybody.